stand, we'd like you to take your Bibles and open to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. <clears throat> and let's begin by looking to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Lord, we can come before you because you've opened the way. You said to come boldly before the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Lord, we come before you today to, in, in, as needy people. We need to hear from you. We need to know you better. We need to be uh, rooted and grounded in the things of God and the most holy word. We need to be studying the word of God that we might rightly divide the word of truth. Lord, we need to be feeding on the manna of the word and Lord, we need to be drawn closer to you. And so we bring all these needs before you and we pray, Lord, that you would bless this time of fellowship and study together to the glory of God. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Okay, this winds up our series on heaven. It's been, uh, this is the sixth week now. And uh, we're going to see heaven, uh, we, or I should say we have seen heaven as paradise. We've seen it as the Father's house. We've seen it as the heavenly city, the New Jerusalem. We saw last week heaven as Zion, Mount Zion, the heavenly Zion. Uh, we've seen it as a literal city. It has geographical locations. Uh, it has a size, the, the size of it is given for us. We saw it last week as a lovely city. It's a beautiful, psychedelic looking place, all the beautiful colors. And today we're going to see it as a living city. Well, if you have your Bibles open to, uh, well, actually, I said Revelation 22. We're going to start in Revelation 21. Uh, we're going to be begin by telling you what heaven will not be like. For the last five weeks, we've talked about what heaven will be like. But let's look, first of all, what it will not be like. Here's what heaven will not be like. First of all, there will be no death. And, and this is found in um, chapter 21, verse 4. There will be no death. There will be no sorrow, there will be no crying, and there will be no pain. All of that is found in Revelation 21.4. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Now just that by itself is, tells us it's going to be a wonderful place. Just all those uh, negative things that will not be there. But that's only scratching the surface. In addition to that, fifthly, we find that there will be no ta uh, temple. That's in chapter 21, verse 22. And the reason there will be no temple, this is in the new heavens and the new earth. The uh, Bible says, and I saw no temple therein. And here's the reason for the Lord... God Almighty, and that word Almighty means omnipotent, all-powerful, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, the Lamb is Jesus, are the temple of it. So they are the temple. Here on earth, our bodies are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit dwells within us, but in heaven they are the temples. So no need of a temple constructed out of block or whatever. Uh, the, uh, the Lord himself is the temple. And sixthly and seventhly, there will be no sun and no moon. At, um, th that's in the next verse, verse 23. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. And again, the reason is given to us. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb, Jesus, he's the Lamb of God, the Lamb is the light thereof. By the way, in the book of Revelation, the key word is Lamb. And I believe off the top of my head, I think it's about 22 times that we see Jesus referred to as the Lamb or the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb. We see him as the Lamb that has been slain. All right, continuing on, number eight, there will be no night. That's in chapter 21 and verse 25. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And then we read, there will be no more curse. Now we go into chapter 22 and verse 3. It says, there shall be no more curse. Do you know, 
the only life that we know about is under the curse. God put the curse on um, this planet, the whole universe and mankind, back when man sinned. And all of the history of humanity from Adam and Eve on has been living under the curse. Now God's creation is a beautiful creation. Uh, there, there's just marvelous things that uh, are on the surface of the earth, above the earth, even under the earth. I remember one time going to Mammoth Cave, and there's this one section of Mammoth Cave. It, it's just all crystal and colors and everything. It's just absolutely beautiful, and it, it's all part of creation. Well, all of the, all of the, the beauties of nature that we've ever seen have been under the curse. Just think what it's going to be like when that curse is lifted. It's because of the curse that we have to work every day. God told Adam he had to eat his bread by the sweat of his brow. And it's because of the curse that there are thorns and thistles and weeds and, and so forth. And it's, uh, it's because of the curse that uh, women are in pain and travail because of ch uh, when the, uh, during childbirth. All of these things are part of the curse. All that is going to be lifted. And um, so there'll be, uh, there'll be no curse. And then number 10, it says there will be no candle, verse uh, 5 of chapter 22, which I take to mean artificial light, because the fifth verse says, and there shall be no night there, and they, then they need no candle, neither light of the sun. Not even sunlight is needed there. And then again, he gives a reason. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And what else will not be there? There will be no death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain, no temple, no sun, no moon, no night, no curse, no candles. And there will be no sinners. Chapter 22, verse 14 and 15. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. And then in verse 15, he says, for without, which means outside the city, outside, outside of heaven, are dogs. You know, the Bible never has anything good to say about a dog for some reason. I don't know why that is. And anytime you read about a dog in the Bible, it's always in a negative context. And he's talking about lost people. He's not talking about four-legged dogs. In Philippians 3.2, it says, beware of dogs. And uh, I often thought it'd be kind of neat if you had a vicious dog, put a little sign up on there in front of your house, Philippians 3.2. <laughs> Let them figure it out for themselves. <laughs> you know, that might be offensive to people. Kind of like that, those uh, gun sites, you know, with 1 Corinthians something or other on it doesn't even have the verse just the scripture the reference and everybody's all bent out of shape over that well anyways uh dogs it's just talking about people two-legged kind and he says for without are dogs sorcerers and by the way that word sorcerers is the greek word pharmaka which is uh, uh, uh drugs that's where we get our english word pharmacy from and so druggies whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So that's what's going to be, or the, I should say that's what is not going to be in heaven. There'll be none of that crowd at all. And then uh, we read there in uh, verse 21, chapter 21, verse 27, we read there, and there shall in no wise enter into anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. And in chapter 21 and verse 8, again, he tells us what won't be there. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcer they're sorcerers again, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Do you ever wonder how liars got in there with all that crowd? You know, that's a pretty scuzzy bunch of people here. The abominable the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and all that. And he's got liars right in the middle of that. Do you ever wonder why? He says, all liars? Well, you know, all human beings are not abominable. 
All human beings are not murderers. All human beings are not whoremongers or sorcerers or idolaters. But all human beings are liars. Everyone, every one of us has lied at, at some time or other. Uh, some people make a habit. I used to know a, a pastor that said to say, uh, lying was a way of life to this man. And uh, it took him right out of the ministry eventually. But um, it's, it, it's a terrible thing. He, he would lie when there's not even a, a profit motive behind it, when there's no reason for it. Well, God, these are what are not going to be in heaven. And so uh, somebody says, well, I'm not so bad. Well, are you a liar? If you're a liar, you're on the outside. Of course, there's a lot of liars that are sinners saved by grace. And that's every one of us under the blood of Christ. All right, well, let's continue on now. This is a living city. It is full of life. Notice in Matthew 22, verse 32, God said, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been dead for about 2,000 years when Jesus spoke those words. And he says, they are alive. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. I'm the, uh, the God of the living. So they were alive. They were in, in God's presence. They were in heaven. And then in Psalm 116, verse 9, the scripture says, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. He's the God of the living, and heaven is the land of the living. It's a place of life. Now, in Revelation chapter 21, which we spent a considerable amount of time in last week, Revelation chapter 21 is actually only the outside of the city. We saw the walls, we saw the gates, we saw the foundations. All that is on the outside of the city, how beautiful it was. Well, in Revelation chapter 2, 22, we see the inside of the city. And the inside of the city is also very obvious, beautiful. Well, outside is death. If you look at chapter 22, verse 14 and 15, we saw that outside are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, and, and so forth. That's what's outside the city. But inside the city, there is life. First of all, we read in Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Each and every one of us became a living soul. And you know what? That soul never dies. That soul lives forever. That soul is going to spend someplace in eternity, whether it's heaven or the lake of fire. It's going to, it's going to live forever. Man became a living soul. And so um, uh, we, we read there that he, uh, he, beca he became a living soul. And that soul goes right on living. And it's going to live someplace. And that's why we need to trust in Christ as your Savior that you're that living soul might be living in heaven for all eternity. Then secondly, it's the place of the living bread. John chapter 51 says, Jesus said, I am the living bread, and look what he says, which came down from heaven. I am the living bread, which came down from heaven, and if any man shall eat of this bread, he shall live forever. He's the bread from heaven. So we see man is a living soul up there in heaven. Jesus is the living bread from heaven. And then thirdly, heaven is filled with living creatures. This is from the book of Ezekiel. Outside of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And then it goes on and describes them. And we find out that those are the cherubims, which is a rank of angels that God has. And by the way, this is our last week in the study of heaven. Next week, we're going to be uh, beginning a four-week series on the study of those cherubims. It's, it's a kind of a continuation of the heaven series. The cherubims are very important, uh, a very important rank of angels. But they are called in the Bible 
living creatures. So we have living souls, living bread, living creatures, and then, best of all, we have the living God. The living God. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31 says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Notice on your note sheets, Hebrews 12, 22. He says, you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God. That's the new Jerusalem that we saw last week. We've come, we come unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, living creatures, all right? Now in Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, we have the book of life. And in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1, we have the water of life. And in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 2, we have the tree of life. Well, this morning we're not going to spend any time on the tree of life because it, back in lesson, le lesson number two, I believe it was, we talked about the tree of life and how it was transplanted from uh, heaven to paradise to the center of the earth and then back up to heaven again. But we're going to concentrate today on the first two, the book of life and the water of life. The water of life, chapter 22 and verse 1, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb. This is the source of life. God is the source of all life. There is no way that non-life can produce life. Uh, evolution is based on that whole uh, theory which is totally, completely wrong without a shred of scientific evidence behind it that life came from non-life. It's ridiculous. Jesus, the Bible says about Jesus, in him was life, John 1, 4. So um, we, see that the, um, uh, we see the book of life and the water of life. Well, first of all, uh, let's consider the water of life. John, uh, Jesus, uh, tell, uh, we are told, is the bread of life. John 6, 48, I'm the bread of life. But the Holy Spirit is the water of life. Jesus is the bread of life, and the Holy Spirit is the water of life. In John 4, 14, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall, shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Notice the top of the next page here, John chapter 7. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, and, that, and, and he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What does this mean? Well, it says, if you notice there in parentheses, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So we find out that the living waters represent the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is the bread of life and the Holy Spirit is the, um, is the, is the water of life. Now something interesting in that passage, John 7, 37 through 39. Jesus said, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Where did the scripture say that? There's no other scripture that says that. But Jesus said, it's in the scriptures. He says, the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, you go all through the Old Testament, you'll find nothing about out of your belly or innermost being rivers of living water. The only place you read that is right here in John chapter 7. So that's the only scripture. But when Jesus spoke those words, the Gospel of John wasn't written. And the Gospel of John wasn't written, wasn't going to be written for another 60 years. It was written right at the end of the first century, around 90 AD. And so when Jesus said, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, he knew John was going to put that 
in the Word of God because the Holy Spirit dictated it to John to put in the Word of God. And it wasn't in the Scriptures for another 60 years yet. But Jesus, being God, uh, he knew that it was going to be Scripture. And so we can, in, in our perspective from time, almost 2,000 years later, we can look back and say, yep, there's the Scripture. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, let's look at some of the things about the water of life. Number one, the water of life is free. It's free. It's like salvation. It's free. You don't earn salvation. You don't work for salvation. It's free. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6, 23. And so it, it, it's a free gift. Well, the water of life is also free. Notice Revelation 21, 6. And he said unto me, it is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Last word there, freely. The water of life, he says, I will give him freely. And then he says it again in Revelation 22, 17. Right at the end of the verse, it says, Come and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So the water of life is free. You know, this morning in the 830 service, Pastor Jim preached on tithing. Had a powerful message on tithing. In fact, it was so good, two people got up and walked out. So that's how good it was. <laughs> and somebody would come back and say, why, uh, if the water of life is free, why do we have to give? Well, the water of life is free. But the plumbing is very expensive. <laughs> it costs a lot to get the water of life out there. So the water of life is free. Then secondly... The water of life is a fountain. Revelation 7, 17. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them in unto living fountains of water. Notice, living, living. It's a place of life. The living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Thirdly, the water of life is forever. It's free. It's a fountain. It's forever. John chapter 4, where Jesus says to the woman, uh, he, uh, he says, If you would have asked of me, I would have given you living water. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Why not? It's everlasting. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. It is forever. It's free. It's a fountain. It's forever. And then fourthly, it's flowing. If you look at uh, um, in verse one there, uh, I'm sorry, verse two, Revelation 22, two, in the midst of the street and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manners of fruits and yielded her fruit every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. It was flowing water that, uh, that the tree of life needs, you know, all, all trees and so forth, plants, they need, uh, they need, um, uh, they need uh, water, and it's flowing water. Flowing water is not stagnant. Flowing water is fresh water. It speaks of life. There can only be life in flowing water. You know, there are two very strange large bodies of water on the face of this earth. One is the Dead Sea, and the other is the Black Sea. Now the Dead Sea, most of us know quite a bit about the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is just dead. It, it has no outlet, and so everything uh, just builds up in it, and there's not a smidgen of life in the Dead Sea. Nothing, there's nothing can live in the Dead Sea. Well, the Dead Sea is representative, or it speaks of an unbeliever. There's just no life there at all. Many people are religious, but religiously they are lost. There's just no life there. They have religion, but not life. Others have no religion, and they're just as dead as the other crowd. So they're just dead. The Dead Sea represents these unbelievers. But the other body of water that is a phenomena is called the Black Sea, 
and that's over uh, by Russia there. And the Black Sea, something happened about 4,300 years ago. Something happened concerning the Black Sea. The Black Sea used to be much smaller than it is today. And there were villages built around the Black Sea. And uh, people lived there, there were houses and so forth. And probably it was the flood of Noah when the flood took place in the days of Noah, water come wash, rushing in, and it covered over where the, um, where the Dead Sea is. It's a, like in a, in a basin. And after the flood water subsided, the Black Sea was still there, but much bigger than it had been before. And all of those villages that were surrounding the old Black Sea were all destroyed. They're all underwater. But some kind of a phenomenon has taken place, which scientists aren't exactly sure what caused it. But for some reason, when the fresh water of the flood came in on top of it, it didn't mix with the old waters of the Black Sea. And from those old waters of the Black Sea, all the oxygen somehow was removed. And so the Black Sea today, the upper part of it, there's life. There's fish and different sea life in the upper part of it. But you only can go down a certain, to a certain depth and then everything below that is dead, non-life. And divers have gone down and, and they have gone down to the bottom of it and they have found these villages that used to be on the edge of the old Black Sea back before the, uh, before the flood came. And the villages are all there, you know, the houses are there and so forth. And so there, at one time there was life in it, but something happened, all the oxygen has gone out. And so today you have the Black Sea that on the surface there is life, but only goes so deep and then there is non-life. Now as the Dead Sea is a picture of unbelievers, the Black Sea is a picture of carnal believers. There's only life on the surface. And you go down, explore the depths, and it's just as dead as can be. The water of life is flowing. The Bible teaches in the book of Leviticus that if you have a disease such as leprosy, that you're to wash in flowing water. Medical science didn't discover this until the 1800s, in the 19th century. They discovered washing hands in flowing water it will uh, uh, prevent the spread of disease and bacteria and so forth. So the, the water of life is free. The water of life is a fountain. The water of life is forever. The water of life is flowing. And finally, the water of life is feeding. It's feeding the tree of life as we read there in verse 2. Did you know that the land of Egypt at one time, and not all that long ago, back about, well, about 3,500, 4,000 years ago, the land of Egypt was a plush, beautiful green place. The land of Egypt, according to Genesis chapter 13 and verse 10, rivaled in looks the Garden of Eden. It was so beautiful. And when Lot separated from Abraham, that's the way he went because it, it looked so, so it was such beautiful countryside. You go to Egypt today and you have 99% of the people living on 1% of the land. 99% of Egypt is uninhabitable. No one lives there except some desert nomads. Only 1% is actually habitable. What happened to Egypt? Well, they, the Egyptians built canals off the River Nile. The River Nile runs right through Egypt. And they built canals and it irrigated the land and, and it was plush and green and so forth. But when, the, when Egypt was conquered, by the way, Egypt is an Arab country today. It is not the original uh, population of Egypt. When the Arabs took over, what they did was just neglect the canals, didn't keep them cleaned out. And because they didn't keep them, keep them cleaned out, they began to fill up 
and the land began to turn back into desert. And today the only life, the only habitable place in Egypt is just right along the River Nile, uh, just a short little small strip on each side, 1%. 99% of their people live on 1% of the land. And so uh, water has to be flowing. It, it brings life. And where there is no water of life, there is no life. Now, secondly, let's look at the book of life. Chapter 21 and verse 27, the last verse of chapter 21. It says, And there shall in no wise enter in anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So the book of life is a book that God keeps. He keeps records. And his records are, of course, perfect because God is perfect. Going to your next page in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul writes, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with others, my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Whose names are in the book of life. Every believer, is his name is recorded in this book of life. Now, if you look in the 19th verse of chapter 22, it says, If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. So this book is very important to have your name in the book of life. If you look, go back to chapter 20 and the last verse of chapter 20, verse 15, we read that whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's a pretty serious thing. If your name is not in the book of life, he says you're doomed to be spend eternity in the lake of fire. So uh, you need to know for sure your name is written in the book of life. Well, in Revelation 13, 8, going back to your note sheet there, it says, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. This is talking about the Antichrist. This is during the tribulation. They're going to worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. All of those that worship the Antichrist, they're going to do, do so because their names are not in the book of life. And then in Revelation 17, 8, we, we read it again. Again, the beast that thou sawest, the beast here is the Antichrist, uh, that was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Notice from the foundation of the world. Now let's do a very quick study of this book of life because the book of life is up there in heaven we read. And there's a lot of future events that take place in, uh, that involve the book of life. Well, first of all, our names, when you're born, and probably before you're born, because God foreknows, God places your name in the book of life. And so every little baby, his name is in the book of life. Now, we know that a little baby is saved. We know that from, remember, David's baby, the little baby that died, newborn baby, and he died, and David said, uh, he can't return to me, but I can go to him, meaning in heaven. So a little baby, the soul of that little baby is going to go to heaven. And I think that this will include also aborted babies, even though they have no name. God has a name for them. God gives them a name. And they're going to be up there in heaven. There's going to be about 40 million little aborted babies that were killed in this country since 1973 when it became legal. They're going to be up there in heaven. Their names will be in the book of life. And so they're placed, it's, it's placed in the book of life at creation. And then it is blotted out at, when you reach the age of accountability. In Exodus chapter 32 and verse 33, the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. He says, whosoever hath sinned against me. Well, that's every one of us. 
Romans 3.23 says, For that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it, he says, I'm going to blot some names out. Everyone, when they reach the age of accountability, you know that you're a sinner, you know how you know you need to be saved. At that point, God takes your name out of the book of life. Look at Deuteronomy 9.14. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their names from under heaven. Again, referring to the book of life. Then, thirdly, your name is put back into the book of life when you get saved. It's written in again, Luke chapter 10 and verse 20. Jesus said, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That's in the book of life. He says, rejoice because your names were written in heaven. Jesus had given his disciples power to heal the sick and cast out demons. And they come back all wonderful. Uh, this, this is so great. Boy, we were casting out demons. Jesus says to them, don't rejoice over that. That's, that's only a, a small thing. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So your name is put back in when you, uh, when you get saved. And it will never, never, ever be blotted out again. Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh, this is a believer. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So we have God's promise. If your name is in the book of life. God's pencil doesn't have an eraser on it. It is there for eternity. And then finally, all of the lost are excluded from the book of life. Revelation 20, 15. And, what, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Well, this is a, a serious thing uh, to, uh, to know that it's a great thing, I should say, to know that your name is in the book of life. Now, God puts a warning right at the end of this chapter against transgressors and tamperers and translators of the word of God. He says, beware. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto those things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. God says you cannot add to the word of God. And then in the next verse, the 19th verse, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. It's a serious, serious offense to tamper with the word of God, adding or subtracting or changing the word of God. I'd like you to see that same verse, how it appears in modern translations. You might get a little shock here, but here's the same verse, verse 19, in a modern translation. If anyone takes words away from the book of this prophecy, God shall take away from him his share in the tree of life. Where'd the tree of life come from? It says the book of life. God says, you mess with my word, and I'll take your name out of the book of life. Well, modern translations are notorious for adding, subtracting, and changing the word of God. And here's one of their changes. They've reduced it from the book of life to the tree of life. Well, the, the word of God says, from the book of life. I'd like to... Make you uh, aware of a man by the name of Frank Logston. Frank Logston, back in the 1950s, was pastor of one of the most pr prestigious churches in America, the Moody Memorial Bible Church in Chicago. And he was, he was well known. He wrote many books. He was a conference speaker. He was, his name was quite familiar. He was known across America. And he had a good friend who was um, Dewey Lockman, head of the Lockman Foundation. And one day, Dewey Lockman said to him that he thought he could secure the copyrights for the 1901 American Standard Version. 
And so um, he asked Frank Logsdon about this. He told him it was a good idea, go ahead. And I'm gonna read a little bit of this. I'm not gonna read this whole page, but I'm gonna re read a little bit uh, to you. And uh, he said that um, uh, he, uh, the Frank Logsdon interviewed the translators of the New American Standard. And he sat with them when they wrote, and when they wrote the preface thereof. And the preface of the New American Standard Bible is essentially the work of Frank Logsdon. You read that, the, the, the preface there in the, in the New American Standard, it's basically his words. And then it says, and when the New American Standard Bible was published, Logsdon received a copy number seven of the 50 deluxe copies which were printed. So he had much to do with that Bible. But then he began to realize, it gives a little bit of the story here, began to realize that he was part of something that God did not like. And these are his words. It says, as he began to research the issue, he confided to his wife, here's what he said, I am afraid I am in trouble with the Lord and I cannot refute the arguments. He went on to say it is wrong, talking about the new translation. He says it is wrong, it is terribly wrong, it is frightfully wrong and I don't know what I'm going to do about it. He says there's nothing I can do. I've, I've been a part of it, I have endorsed it. And finally he writes a letter to Dewey Lockman and he says that, he says, we've been friends for a long time and I hope we can continue to be friends. But he says, the only thing I can do under God is to renounce every attachment to the New American Standard Bible. Well, here was, here was a man that took Revelation 22, 18 and 19 very seriously. And he said, I'm a part of it. I didn't know what I was doing. He says, I'm in trouble with the Lord. Well. The word of God is an occupant of heaven. It isn't just here on earth, it's also up in heaven. Now, the word of God is both the written word, which is the Bible, and the incarnate word, which is Jesus. Both are the living word. And Jesus, first of all, is the incarnate word. John 1:14 says, the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And when we read 1 Timothy 3.16, we find out it says God was manifest in the flesh. So the word of God is God Almighty, is Jesus himself. He was made flesh. So the Bible is the written word. And both are the living word, the incarnate word and the written word. Both are the living word and both occupy both heaven and earth. Now in, in uh, the Gospel of John, John chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Three times in that verse we have the word heaven. But in the modern translations, there is a movement to take out heaven. And this is one instance in those last Four words are removed. And you know what happens when you remove those four words? You take out the deity of Christ. One of the many places where the deity of Christ is taught. Jesus was on earth. And he says at the same time he is in heaven. Here's how it reads in the modern translation. Takes out that which is in heaven. And so Jesus is just on earth. But the Bible says he is omnipresent. That means he can be every place all at once. And Jesus, as he stood here on earth talking to Nicodemus there in John chapter 3, was still also in heaven because he is God. That's one of the proof texts that Jesus is, um, that Jesus is God. He is the incarnate word. We're not going to read the whole passage, but Revelation chapter 19, his name is called the word of God. So he's in heaven and he's on earth at one and the same time. Now the written word also is in heaven and on earth at one and the same time. Psalm 119 verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And so the written word is on earth. Second Peter 121 says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But the master copy is in heaven. God's got a master copy up there. He don't change that master copy that's written forever in heaven. And you know what? God says 
that he will not, under any circumstances, change his word. He will not do it. Psalm 89, verse 34. He says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. God won't do it, but a lot of men will and have. And he says, It is forever. The word of God is going to outlast this present earth and this present heaven. Did you know that? When this present earth is gone and the present heaven is gone, the word of God will still endure. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. This is the only thing in this life, this is the only thing that you can take into eternity with you. The word of God, it'll be there for all eternity. Heaven and earth will pass away, then God's going to replace the heaven and the earth with the new heavens and the new earth, but the word of God is going to still be there. Heaven and earth pass away, but his word will still continue to be there. And Hebrews chapter 12, right at the end of the verse, it says, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. God has given the word from heaven. He's the word that speaketh from heaven. So in John 3.13, Heaven was removed. One of the three times it was removed, taking away the deity of Christ in many modern versions. Have you ever seen Luke, uh, the Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11? It's on the next page there. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to read it because most of us are familiar with it. But look what gets taken out in the modern versions. It's, um, it says, Our Father... And it takes out which art in heaven. Heaven's been removed. See that? It says, Father, hallowed be thy name. Took out heaven, which art in heaven. And then the line that says, thy will be done as it is in heaven. That's also removed. So twice heaven is removed from the Lord's prayer. And then at the end, after it says, lead us not into temptation, but continues on and says, deliver us from evil, that also has been removed. Heaven has been removed. In Luke 22, 43 and 44, and I'll have to be honest with you on this. Um, this was taken out of the New American Standard where it says there appeared an angel unto him from heaven and strengthened him and being in agony he prayed more earnestly and he sweat as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That was not put in the New American Standard. They have since put it back in. I guess they must have got some flack about Jesus where he, in the Garden of Gethsemane where he sweat great drops of blood. They put that one back in. Going to the next page, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. He talks there about uh, you have in heaven a better and enduring uh, substance. That heaven is again taken out. Why is heaven removed so much? Well, for one thing, the cults don't believe in a heaven. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe in a heaven, but they believe it's full. You can't get in. That's what they teach. They believe that the, the 144,000 were all Jehovah's Witnesses. And they filled up heaven, and the best you can hope for is if you become a Jehovah's Witness, you can uh, dwell on the earth in the millennium. <laughs> That's their teaching. Mormons don't believe in a heaven. They believe in reincarnation. You just keep getting reincarnated until you reach God-like status. The liberals and the modernists, they don't believe in a heaven. It's just uh, uh, kind of like a, a fairy story. Many do not believe in heaven, so heaven gradually becomes deleted time and time again. 1 John 5, 7, the whole verse is removed that has heaven in it. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Revelation chapter 16, verse 17, here we have heaven removed again. And it says, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven. And that, uh, those two words, of heaven, uh, has been removed. Now, who would want, not want us to learn about heaven? This is the sixth week in this series where we're studying heaven. Who does not want us to study about heaven? Who does not want us to read about heaven? And who does not want us to go to heaven? Now, well, his name is Satan. And he doesn't, he doesn't even want you to know 
about heaven. Now, along with that, hell has also been deleted out of modern, uh, modern versions. In the King James, the word hell is found 53 times. In the, well, use the NIV, but it's, it's in all the modern versions. It's only found 14 times. Wow, something's really wrong there. How can it go from thir uh, 31 to, uh, or what is it? Yes, uh, 53 to 14, quite a difference. And then in the Old Testament, in the King James, we find hell 31 times, modern versions, zero. They've taken hell right out. Now by the same token, who doesn't want you to believe in hell? None of the cults believe in hell. And that's what makes them attractive to people. I can live any way I want to and I don't have to worry about hell after I die. You know? Well, the Bible speaks much about hell. And so then um, God talks about omitting things from his earthly book. He says, I will omit you from my heavenly book. Verse 19, I'll take away his part out of the book of life. Well, in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, Eve in the Garden of Eden added, subtracted, and changed the word of God. They only had just God's one commandment there, but she added to it, and she subtracted from it, and she changed it. We come to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and we find that men are still adding to it, subtracting from it, and changing it. If it were not so, God would not have put Revelation 22, 18, and 19 in his book. Well, um, um, the, um, <clears throat> let's move on to the, to the next page here. And I don't want to spend much time on this because we don't have much time. But for two pages here, just in the book of Revelation, not only is heaven, but all kinds of things have been removed been removed from the Word of God. I'm not going to read them, but there's two pages there. And you can see the underlined parts and what has been taken out of just the last book of the Bible. And so there's, there's quite a few of them there. On the next page, there's an article from Thomas Nelson Publishers. Responding to a reader's survey, Thomas Nelson Incorporated will begin its popular new living translation of the Bible, minus minor prophets, Amos and Nahum. It's bad enough they have taken out verses, but now they're taking out whole books. They're going to take out Amos and Nahum. And the reason is given, people, if people want to read them, they'll have to find them elsewhere. This lady, this Phyllis Brenly, she says people just aren't reading them anymore. So they don't read Amos, don't read Nahum. Okay, take it out. Boy, scary stuff. And then we read also, goes farther, it says that they have taken red pens to Leviticus, nipping and tr trimming, now watch this, the stuff that has absolutely no relevance to modern day life. What has no relevance to modern day life? And she says, Leviticus reads better in abridged form. There's more storyline. Then it goes on and it states that uh, they're considering uh, getting rid of some of the Psalms and merging uh, First and Second Kings with First and Second Chronicles. This is scary stuff. I guess they've never read Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19. On the next page, I think this is so ironic. From the book of Amos. Amos is one of the books they want to remove in Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, God says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of God. Amos writes here, God says through Amos, there's going to be a famine of the word of God. And it's in the book of Amos. That's one, that's one of the books they want to remove from the Bible. And then the 12th verse says, They shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. The famine in the land. And Amos chapter 7, verse 16, Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. He says, Don't tamper with the word of God. Don't remove any of it. 
Now, if you thought that was bad, here is a Dutch Bible it's coming out in the, um, over in the Netherlands. In fact, it, it's already out. It came out in the year 2006. Um, it's a new publication of the Bible by a Dutch organization which could take a lot of stress out of reading the Holy Book's instruction for contemporary Christians. You get stressed out when you read the Bible, read something you don't like, don't worry, get a Dutch Bible. They, all the stress is removed here. It says that's because those troublesome verses about justice for the poor, responsibility for the rich to address their neighbor's needs, and all that talk about money is gone, not just edited out, it's cut out. And the name of the group is called the Western Bible Foundation. They published the book to meet the growing wish of many churches to be market oriented and more attractive. Make the Bible more attractive. Cut out all the stuff that you don't like that's in it. You know, Thomas Jefferson did that. You ever hear the Jefferson Bible? He cut out every verse that he didn't like. And he didn't have a whole lot left when he got done. And here's what their spokesman said. Jesus was very inspiring for our inner health, but we don't need to take his naive remarks about money seriously. After all, he didn't study economics. And he goes on and he says, no serious Christian takes such texts literally anyways. He says, what if Christians stopped being anxious, for example, and started expecting everything from God? <laughs> Wouldn't that be awful? Or gave their possessions to the poor? For that manner, our economy would be lost, like our economy is so good today. He says, the truth is quite the contrary. A strong, a strong economy and a healthy work ethic is a gift from God. So he goes on and he states that we want to, and this sounds like Star Trek, we want to boldly go where no one else has gone before by eliminating those texts out of the Bible. So they have discarded passages of the Ten Commandments, sections of Isaiah and Proverbs, the Sermon on the Mount, and they have left big holes. They didn't rush it together. They just left these big holes where the original text used to be, which they call radical. And so they, uh, uh, it goes on and says that this Bible has sold hundreds in just a few weeks of availability. Well, let's go to the last, the last page here now. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. We're going to be known as we are known. We're going to know each other in heaven. You can look up these verses as you, uh, it's your spare time. Then we are told not only will we know each other in heaven, but we will be like Jesus, 1 John 3, 2. We're going to be with him, John 14, 3. And heaven is by reservation, 1 Peter 4, 1. And we read in the, uh, in the Psalms, Psalm 45, about God. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God thy God, this is Jesus he's speaking of, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows, and all thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia, and out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. The ivory palaces. God is dwelling in heaven in the ivory palaces. This is the Father's house. And Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Well, that brings us to the end of our study in heaven. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, dismiss us with your blessing now. May we leave here rejoicing because we can say our names are written in the book of life. In Jesus' name, amen.